What a happened? Little fast. <laughs> You've got applause already, okay. but we've got a good audience here. Four, in. three, two, one, and lift off. Debrief, Apollo 8. Roger. We're going to see if we can find the stars here before we uh, do the T-52. This is Mission Control. It stands as the first rank of the unnumbered and innumerable Apollo team. Flight controllers man the consoles. They watch a continuing readout of every system in the capsule, three shifts around the clock. Good morning, <laughs> and welcome to XC 2018. Uh, my name is Ivica, and I'm general chair of uh, the conference. I'm Marcia Ciechik, and I'm a program co-chair of the conference. Hello, I'm Mark Harm, and I'm also program co-chair. But we also have other people who want to uh, welcome you. So we have organizing committee. So organizing committee, please stand up. If you are here, of course, please stand up. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't, 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 don't applaud. <laughs> we are not finished yet <laughs> because we have more people. In addition, we would like the uh, program board and the program committee of the technical track to please welcome everybody. Please stand up. Okay. Don't applaud. Don't worry if it's there. And in addition to that, there's the program committee members for all of the different tracks in the conferences. Could, could you stand up, please, to uh, welcome everybody today? No. Okay. And we also have uh, some more people. So it's from the workshops, uh, co-located events, a uh, thousand approximately people. Please stand up. If you are a member of this, please stand up. Yes, stand up, stand up, please. But that's not all. There are more people. Stay, stay, stay up, stay up, stay, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up. It's not finished. Yeah. We have, uh, we have uh, 530 PhD students. Students, please stand up. And we have people from industry here. Uh, 400 on the conference. Please stand up with you who are from uh, companies. Yeah, and that's not all. In total, we have uh, 1,765 participants, so please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> please. In fact, in, indeed, 1,765 participants is a comfortable record attendance level for ICSI, so give yourselves a round of applause for being part of a record-breaking ICSI. Uh -huh. And let's see if we can wake up the people who are sadly still abed and would wish that they were here with us today to celebrate. <laughs> well, that went down. And uh, as you know, this conference is in Gothenburg and uh, is hosted by the uh, uh, city of Gothenburg and by uh, Chalmers uh, University. And I would like to invite uh, President and CEO Stefan Bankston and uh, Deputy uh, Lord Major Elizabeth Rothenberg to welcome you. Thank you, Ivica. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Stefan Bengtsson, being the president of Chalmers. It's a pleasure, of course, welcoming you here to the Swedish Fair, to Gothenburg, and to Chalmers University of Technology for the 40th International Conference on Software Engineering. Uh, software Engineering is an extremely powerful an important technology that will change the way we work and change the way how we find solutions. And we could have a little bit of a perspective here with the pictures in the starting and we see the coming of a new time, uh, which will be discussed here probably. Uh, for Chalmers, of course, this is, uh, we are University of Technology, educating engineers, architects, 
We edu run education for the nautical and maritime sector, and we also educate teachers. Um, for us, this is, of course, an extremely important area. Uh, the core activities are run within our Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, however, uh, the use of the technology and the, the uh, uh, connected areas in the information and communication technology is within many departments. And we have organized this with a cross-disciplinary area of advance, actually having Ivich as the director coordinating, connecting our researchers, teachers and students across the departments and to form platforms for co collaboration with the industry. And that collaboration in this particular field and in many other fields, of course, are extremely important because to find the solutions here and to find the applications and to really introduce the new technology, we have to co-produce co results between academia, industry and other actors. And we try to do that uh, in the best way we can, finding ways of, of working together for, for a, a more efficient development of new knowledge and also spreading an application of this knowledge. I would also like to, to mention here our sister university in the city, University of Gothenburg, which is a comprehensive university, also running uh, information and communication technology activities and related areas. And actually, we are running our activities, the two universities, in a very coordinated effort in actually departments that are what we call integrated. They basically behave as if they are one department, although they belong to two universities. So we will clearly see uh, uh, that this technology will, will mean a lot for the future development of industry and for, for our competitiveness, as well as for the ability of creating a better and more sustainable world by applying the technology to do that. So as president of Chalmers, I'm very proud of being one of the hosts for the conference. So again, very much welcome here and good luck with your discussions. Thank you very much. My name is Elisabeth Rotenberg. I'm deputy Lord Mayor of Gothenburg. And uh, I will welcome you all, distinguished speakers, as I understand, from all over the world, participants and organizers. I wish you all heartily welcome to Gothenburg. More than a million people come to here every year to participate in small and big conferences, sport events and pop concerts and so on. So the city has become an important place for different kind of official meetings. And now we are very proud to host this, the 40th International Conference of Software Engineering, the 40th anniversary, as I understood from the program. Uh, but there is also another anniversary, anniversary uh, 50 years of software engineering as total. So congratulations. Uh, I will give you some short facts, only very shortly, uh, about the city. This city is by tradition a harbour city, so trading and shipping has been very important. We have, has, have many trading houses historically and we have had several shipyards. In more modern time, um, uh, industry has been uh, more, it has been more of the uh, automotive uh, industry uh, as Volvo. SCOF is also located in Gothenburg, and we have also Ericsson in the city. So, um, quality development and research are important conditions for improvement within all areas. Software engineering is a scientific branch with great importance for almost all parts of society. New knowledge must be shared and discussed, and there is collaboration between industry, academy, and practitioners, uh, very important. So meetings like this one is of extreme importance uh, to take the knowledge a little bit further. I wish you all good luck with this meeting and what it has to bring. 
By experience, I know myself that on a conference like this one, you're busy occupied by meeting people you already know, people you want to learn to know, maybe preparation uh, of a speech, or going and listen to other speech. Uh, but I hope, of course, as hostess from the city, that you also will take some time to just enjoy the city and the environments. Just across the road, you have the amusement park, Liseberg, and there are, of course, very many rides. You don't need to experience the rides. You could just strolling around in the park, having a beer or a glass of wine. But there are also very many other areas in the city that are very, very nice. Uh, we have worked hardly on the weather, and it seems like we have success so far. So, uh, finally, I used to raise my glass uh, to say cheers in Swedish skål. It's not the right time for that uh, at the moment. So, uh, I will finish by saying good luck with your conference and very welcome to Gothenburg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have uh, uh, books. Uh, we have uh, uh, did a book about the conferences, about the 40 editions. So you can read about the history of uh, this conference. Thank, so you, thank very you very much. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Uh, and I would like to say some uh, uh, information about the conference and around the conference. Uh, and of course, we had uh, great uh, support, of course, from our sponsors, uh, ACM and uh, IEEE and uh, Sixsoft and uh, TCSE and uh, a number of, uh, of supporters, including the Platinum supporters, Chalmers included, but then Code Valley, uh, Ericsson, and Facebook, and you can see uh, many others. So thanks to them, uh, we can uh, uh, have much more flexibility in the program, and uh, you can have like a nicer, nicer uh, being here. Uh, but also, uh, these companies are very active, and sponsors that are also uh, uh, here uh, at uh, the conference, and you will meet them during this week. Uh, so, a little bit about uh, data. Okay, I already said. So, this is like uh, the latest numbers uh, from the, today. Uh, 1,765 uh, participants in total, while for this main part of the conference is uh, 1,365. Uh, uh, if we look at the uh, distribution according to countries, then uh, US is usually on the first place, but now on the second place we actually have Sweden. And uh, uh, this is a record which will hold for many years, I'm quite uh, sure, <laughs> for Sweden. <laughs> and then we have uh, also uh, other countries. Uh, but uh, in total we have uh, people from uh, 56 different countries, which is also the largest number of uh, participants uh, from different countries. Uh, if you look uh, about the distribution, so almost 50% of you are first time of this conference. So I hope uh, you, that the first time here, that uh, you will say, oh, this is a fantastic conference, and you will continue to go. Uh, to, to come to the end with those which are like more than 10 times uh, here uh, with 7%. About one third are PhD students, mostly PhD students, also master students. Uh, and uh, of these students, uh, slightly more than 50% are first time of this conference, on this conference. If you look uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, academia industry, academia 75%, and the industry, including the research institutes, so it's approximately 25%, uh, uh, so it's a nice, uh, nice uh, uh, distribution. Uh, male, female, gender, uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, 68 male, 90% uh, uh, female, and 13% uh, not declared. Uh, if you look at the publications, so which people are coming here, so it's about one third which are coming to listen, uh, which is really great, and uh, about uh, two-thirds which have a particular uh, article in proceedings. So in total, there have been uh, almost 3,000 authors uh, in uh, uh, 
1,010 uh, papers, which are in uh, numerous uh, proceedings. I don't uh, remember now. Is it 26 or 40? I forgot that. Uh, the conference is ongoing. Of course, now it's uh, uh, started on. It started on Sunday, and we had uh, 29 workshops, almost uh, 800 attendees on the workshops. They will be also on Saturday. Uh, eight collocated events with uh, 700 attendees, approximately, and some uh, other uh, events. In addition, maybe you have seen yesterday, we had a communication with uh, uh, Lynn Holman Software Development Day, which is a local, uh, local summit uh, each year. It, it uh, um, attracts about uh, 500, 600 developers, software developers. So we can say that uh, this week there are many people working with software in Gothenburg. I think that uh, it, there's never been so many people working with software here. Uh, for the main uh, conference, uh, there are uh, many, uh, there are nine tracks and there are 88 sessions, so you can really choose what you like, uh, it's, uh, uh, they are, many of them are going in parallel, actually nine tracks in parallel. We have uh, five uh, plenary sessions, and you can see all these uh, different tracks. Uh, in total, they are coming with uh, almost 300 papers. Uh, I would also like to mention that there is posters and uh, exhibitions during these three days, and they will be in the main place where the, the lunch is. And uh, after the lunch, the presenters, the authors of the poster will be there, so you can uh, go there and visit and uh, discuss, the per to talk with them. Uh, that will be the case also in the afternoon. Uh, specifically today, uh, 6.30, it's a town hall meeting where will be discussion about, about the conference, but also uh, the awards uh, will be also given. And the text which you don't see, it says that tomorrow we start 8.30, okay? And on Friday we start at 8.15. Okay, so you have to wake up and come on time. This is the venue, uh, it's big. Uh, so, uh, uh, there is Congress Hall here, and uh, you, you, you have seen uh, a registration desk and foyer, and uh, quite near is the area for uh, lunch, uh, for posters, and then you have two levels of uh, where there, there are the rooms. On this level, the H and the G and R rooms, and uh, on uh, uh, the first level, E1 to E4 uh, also rooms. Uh, so, uh, if you get lost, don't worry. There is plenty of information around. Just, just search for it. Uh, of course, we have the web page, and uh, we have also the brochure, and we have the app, uh, conference publishing serv uh, uh, services conference app. And of course, you can uh, look and uh, you can uh, also write some news uh, using uh, Twitter and Facebook. So you, you can see here the keys, XCConf, uh, XC2018. Of all plenary sessions and industry forum sessions will be uh, streamed in live. So if you have friends which uh, could not make to come here, you can say them so they, they can uh, see these presentations. And finally, if you, if you really don't know uh, how to find information, you will see people in yellow shirts, they, they know everything. So just ask them student volunteers and their chairs. Uh, I can mention that uh, Christian, which you can see on the picture, uh, the first day he, he walked uh, 17 kilometers. It was not because he could not find uh, the, the way, so, uh, uh, but, so set up your counters and, uh, uh, and uh, you will get a good feeling <laughs> for walking. Uh, just a few highlights. Uh, so we have many, uh, Excited keynotes. We are very excited about ha having such distinguished speakers uh, uh, today and tomorrow and uh, on Friday, uh, plenary or in uh, in the uh, parallel uh, sessions. Uh, 
the other highlight is uh, interaction with the industry, which we try to get as much as possible. So that's why we have this special uh, event, uh, Industry Forum, which continues directly after uh, the first part. Uh, we thought that, okay, maybe some 200, maybe 250 people will be interested for that, but you see the interest is very high. Uh, and uh, there are several speakers, but also we have like um, some activities for interactions, eat and meet. So during lunch, uh, industry forum participants will sit together uh, from industry people together with academia people. And then we also have a session which is uh, speed dating, which is like uh, fast uh, uh, discussions. Uh, the other uh, big event is about uh, celebration of 50 years of software engineering and uh, 40th edition of ICSI, also with uh, uh, very known uh, speakers. And uh, during the, the entire day tomorrow, and which will finish with the banquet, and then on Friday we have a conclusion of this celebration. Uh, we also have some social activities. So quite uh, near here, today, at uh, 9 o'clock, we have a reception at the uh, Universeum. If you don't know where it is, so search for a dinosaur. Uh, you see, if you don't find the di dinosaur, then follow a lot of people. It's just on the other side of the, the street. And it's uh, like a museum on several levels. Uh, so you can go around and uh, visit the terrace. There are several nice things. One is uh, the beautiful view. And if the weather is nice, which it will be. So, and the other things, I will not tell what it is, but it's uh, worth to go up. Uh, don't forget, uh, just take your badge. And uh, before that, so after uh, finishing uh, today's programs, uh, uh, there are like preparation for, for the uh, reception. So we, have, like, we will have like two big groups of people. So people which are registered for Industry Forum will have after work aperitivo in foyer. And the people which did not register for uh, uh, Industry Forum can go to H2. Uh, to the town hall, there will be discussions, uh, awards, ceremony, and aperitivo. Uh, and tomorrow we will have a banquet on the other side of the river. Uh, we will go there by buses about uh, 6 o'clock, between 6 to, to uh, uh, 6.30. Uh, it takes uh, 20 minutes uh, driving by bus. Uh, you can use also uh, public transport if you wish, including the ferry and uh, we will have a very nice time, I hope, there. Okay, don't forget your badge, because on the badge it's written that you have a, a, a banquet here, so. But uh, if you will not come, then please uh, tell at the registration desk that you will not come, so that you free place for someone else. And stay in shape. Yeah, I mentioned that uh, you can walk inside the venue, but you can also take a morning run tomorrow morning. If you don't know, if you wake up, it's a long, long, the uh, sun is already up. So tomorrow, 6.30 from here, uh, uh, you can uh, take a tram, I think, and then uh, you can run 5K or 10K uh, uh, around the lake and come back to the uh, to the starting program tomorrow morning. Uh, we have also football teams. Yesterday there were several playing and it's also on uh, Thursday. And that's about uh, the local things at the conference. And now Marsha and Mark will say something about the technical program. Thank you, Ivica. It is our extreme pleasure to welcome you to the ICSI technical program. Um, interesting. Yes. Okay. Um, 
We have, um, we have received um, almost a record number of papers. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Um, but we've received 502 papers uh, submitted altogether uh, by 1,493 authors from 52 countries. Uh, the main contributors were from uh, United States, from China, from Germany, from Canada. I'm very proud of that. Um, from the United Kingdom, and then there was a significant number of submissions from Sweden, which I'm sure pleased Divica tremendously. Uh, the way that our reviewing was done um, was we had uh, a, a system that included um, the program committee, and we had over 100 people on the program committee, and a program board with 35 members, and what the committee was trying to do, obviously, is review papers. They were also trying to do online discussions about the papers and then try to reach consensus, um, accepting and rejecting papers if they were able to do that. For the program board members, they were overseeing reviewing and then uh, they were attending a program board meeting where they would discuss the papers about which the program committee was unable to reach consensus and then trying to make decisions about those. So overall, they've exchanged something like 10,000 comments uh, to make sure that the papers that are accepted um, are, are done so uh, after the, 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 most the, the best available um, consideration. Um, we have accepted uh, 105 papers altogether, and those papers came from the authors uh, of 30 countries with the overall 21% acceptance rate. Um, and uh, the biggest, um, and then the countries that uh, ended up with most papers were the United States and China and Germany and Canada and uh, Netherlands uh, and a few others. As far as statistics over the years, we were very much hoping to get the highest number of submissions. We didn't. The highest number came in 2016. It was 530 papers. This year we got 502. Uh, but if you look at the statistics over the years, uh, our acceptance rate uh, was 21%, which was slightly on the highest uh, range of the scale. And overall, the number of papers which are being presented here, 105, is the highest ICSI has ever had. As far as topics submitted and accepted, um, what we're seeing here is, uh, it kind of gives you an idea of where the hottest uh, topics are. And ours are in empirical software engineering, in program analysis, in mining software repositories, tools and environments, uh, verification and validation, and a few others. Um, what is interesting is program synthesis, which is a sub-area of uh, program analysis, um, received the highest percentage of acceptances, about 40%. Um, there were also uh, a healthy number of topics sort of submitted throughout the whole category, um, as you can see on this graph. Um, all right. Thank you, Marsha. Um, so I'd like to also join Marsha and Avitsa and the uh, others in welcoming you all to uh, ICSI this year, especially if this is your first ICSI. As Avitsa said, about half the people, 48% of the people here, are attending ICSI for the first time. So I'd really love to encourage you to take every opportunity to meet and chat with all the people here. It's quite a challenge to talk to 1,746 people. Don't try and cover them all. I'm sure you'll feel quite exhausted by Friday, but I hope you'll feel that it was time well spent. And please don't feel shy if this is the first conference you've ever attended. Everybody here is friendly. There might be a lot of rushing about, and you might feel a bit disorientated, but it's perfectly okay in the culture of this conference to just go up to somebody, introduce yourself, and just say, well, what are you working on? So please do feel free to use the conference to confer, because that's the whole idea. So, as uh, Marsha said, we have some interesting data for you on topics. All of the data we're going to present today will be in a steering committee report, which is currently under review by the steering committee, but will be released to the community as a whole. It's essentially Marsha and I's first paper together, 
It's got a lot of data in it, and it's currently under minor revisions, I hope, with the steering committee, and then we'll hopefully be able to release it to you. Uh, so one of the changes we made this year, probably the biggest change, was that this is the first ICSI in the history of ICSI which has used full double-blind reviewing. And we're very proud to say that this seemed to work actually even better than we'd expected. So the idea of double-blind reviewing is not that nobody knows who the authors are. It's not an adversarial system in which we try and prevent people from knowing author identities. Rather, the idea is that when you're reviewing a paper, you should try and forget about author identity. You should try and not make that an issue. And as program chairs and the program board and program committee, our job is to try and make the process make that as easy as possible. And as authors, the job is to try and make it as easy for us to make the process as double-blind as possible. So here's some information about that. Essentially, at submit time, if somebody blatantly broke the rules, they put their name all over the first page, we would just desk reject that. There weren't many like that. Then quite a few people, because this is the first time, make little mistakes. So we, we give people some chance to submit their paper again. And, and there were several cases like that, all of which were dealt with. And then during the PB meeting, critically, the only people whose identities ever get revealed to this community are those who have papers accepted. All the rest of the identities are, are never known to the program committee. And so this is a full so-called heavy double-blind process where author identities are only ever revealed for accepted papers. We do a survey, uh, Tom Zimmerman from Microsoft very kindly organized for us uh, a survey of the program committee and the program board. Um, I won't go into all of the details here, but Marsha and I were very grateful and very uh, relieved to see that the overall satisfaction rate for the process was high. In terms of the double blind aspects of the process, the program committee and the program board in general by quite a large margin, felt that this, this process worked for them. Uh, there will be lots more details in our report, but the, the, the take-home message is that basically this double-blind process does work for this conference. And when we compare responses to the survey from authors and PB members, in general, although people do recognize that double-blind involves a little bit of extra work, both for authors and for PB and PC members, the net result is generally a good one. As I say, there will be details in our report. We also have some awards which we were going to present on Friday, so we're not going to ask people who are getting awards to come up now, but the awards will be presented on Friday. Um, so there, we, we actually had uh, 101 reviewers, as Marsha said, but of those, uh, everybody did a fantastic job, we have to say, but we wanted to identify some who did a particularly even extra outstanding job on top of that. And, and those are these people whose, whose names are listed here. Um, we could give them a brief round of applause now as a group. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but that's okay. Hmm? That's okay. But just to mention, if your name's on this list, you will receive an award certificate on Friday at the awards ceremony. We also asked some of our reviewers to be able to essentially be a cadre of rapid response, reliable reviewers. If you're ever the program chair for a conference, I strongly recommend this process. So they take a slightly lighter load to start with, but in exchange for that, they have a service level agreement whereby they agree to jump in at the last minute and do lots of very high, high quality, high precision, high speed, reliable reviewing at the last minute. So let's just thank the people on this list who have very kindly agreed to do that for us. We also have a number of distinguished paper awards. Of the 105 papers, we are allowed to uh, nominate up to 10% for a distinguished paper award, uh, and eight have received that award. I'm going to hand over to Marsha to uh, announce those awards today as well. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so we have uh, overall chosen eight papers to receive distinguished paper awards, and again, we will be awarding these people certificates uh, during the award ceremony on Friday morning. Today, all we're doing is we're running through the list and asking you to please acknowledge them. Uh, the first paper is Spatial Technical Context Reduction, a pointer analysis-based static approach for detecting use after free vulnerabilities. The second paper is Identifying Design Problems in the Source Code, a Grounded Theory. A third one is Generalized Data Structure Synthesis. A fourth one is Traceability in the Wild, Automatically Augmenting Incomplete Trace Links. The fifth one is Towards Optimal Concolic Testing. 
Another one is static automated program repair for heap properties. Automated localization for unreproducible builds. Large scale analysis of framework specific exceptions in Android apps. If you were authors of any of the eight distinguished paper awards, can you please rise? Thank you and congratulations. Before we say goodbye um, and welcome, um, one last thing I wanted to say is our 105 papers are being augmented with a significant number of journal first papers. So we have uh, 48 papers that were selected from three of the top software engineering journals, Transactions in Software Engineering, TOSM, and Empirical Methods in Software Engineering. So there will be 48 such papers augmenting our program. And overall, the technical program will be running for the next three days between four and six parallel tracks. So we're very much hoping that you will use the opportunity to get acquainted with that technical program, as well as a number of other tracks uh, that are running as part of the main conference. And with this, we want to wish you the next, um, well, all the knowledge and all the experiences and all the enjoyment that ICSI can bring for the next three days. And we wish you to have a great ICSI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and we continue directly with uh, our first uh, keynote, uh, Magnus Frodig from Ericsson, uh, acting head of Ericsson Research. And uh, uh, you can see the title, Communication System and Networks, Key Enablers for Digitizing Industry and Society Opportunities and Challenges. So it's about the communication. And we know, we usually say for software that software is enabler. But when we come to communication, yes, there is software enabling communication, but communication is actually enabling software. So this is very exciting, and uh, I'm inviting Magnus to come and to give us this uh, presentations. presentation. So please come. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, just to uh, say, uh, Magnus has been for many years at uh, Ericsson uh, Research uh, on the leading positions uh, with uh, participating in building up many technologies, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And uh, you are also a junk professor at Royal Institute of Technology. So, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. And okay, you have it here, and just to find the presentation. So great, so now we have the software working here. So uh, it is a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk to all of you. And the, the talk here today would be about sort of the digitalization of industry and society and really about the technology that we see will be needed in order to, to get this uh, to become the reality. And uh, I, I will sort of talk about sort of the connectivity, the, the communication part of this. I will also address sort of the compute and, and the properties of this compute that will be needed. And also then the applications and the machine intelligence on top of that. I think you all here will have different starting points in trying to understand this. And some of you will come sort of from the application side. A lot of you in here will come sort of on the compute capabilities, and myself, I'm sort of entering this very much from a network and connectivity aspects. So as um, said here, I've been sort of working on this connectivity for almost 30 years. So I started with 2G and, and with GSM was introduced. And now lately I've been working for five, 10 years on getting the 5G systems standardized, and we are just about to enter the market here. So it's, it's very interesting, interesting days. 
So uh, reflecting back a little bit on this journey, starting with the GSM systems, uh, where we had voice and we were very proud of that we have digital voice. And now we are in a situation where we have a smartphone in our hands and, and this is sort of the most valuable gadget everybody is carrying, except clothes and shows perhaps. Otherwise we all, all, all are, are, are using this smartphone in, in our lives. And let's look at a short video here on a little bit setting the, the stage where we are today on this. And this, is, uh, this was done one year ago or something, so the numbers have increased even further since this, but um, I think you get the message here. So, I think we, uh, we can all agree on this one. The pace of change will, will ever be slower than today. I think we are seeing how, how these technologies are picking up and, and we are seeing an enormous development on the usage of the mobile broadband systems of today. So, this is of course um, one aspect that we, that we will see that the mobile broadband communications that we all use sort of that they will evolve and and, the, and the, here we will see uh, an increase in, in, in the data rates and in, in, uh, the, the data volumes that each of us consume every month and so on. We will also see other ways of interacting with these systems and then you can imagine different sort of gaming experiences that will be available. You can think about sort of taking part in, in sort of live events in different ways and sort of the, all the developments around the virtual and mixed realities and all of that. But that's sort of a, that's sort of a predictable and, and I think we can also sort of try to foresee that. What, what is really now changing with, with the introduction of, of 5G is the, the, the capabilities of, of taking this technology and, and moving that out into different sectors by connecting all the different things we have around us and, and going in and digitalizing all the different sectors in, in, in the society from the smart cities to the industries and everything. I think the change that we have in front of us is enormous. So, um, and, and I think we see the signs. It's not that this is coming by a surprise. We see the different signs. But it's a such, a such a large change that we have in front of us. So it's still a little bit difficult to, to really understand how it will unfold, how it will begin, what parts that it will develop first and everything. So it's very interesting to think about this. And I think you will sort of, I would like to inspire you to think about this future that we, we all sort of see different parts of today. So let's look a little bit into the technology components that that are the fundamental for this. And uh, starting here from the connectivity side, I think we, we all know about uh, the development of telephony and, and for the first 100 years of telephony we were connecting places and that peaked and we had more than 1 billion places connected uh, with that. And then in the beginning of the 80s we had the first mobile, mobile uh, sort of communication systems where we have voice communication and then we had the 2G where we have the digital voice and, and some SMSs. And uh, then we started to add the data capabilities. It was really, really, really low data rates, but we were proud of them by then with GPRS. And one of my first projects were to work on the edge to improve GPRS systems. And these are still around, right? Sometimes it happens that you are connected to, to edge. And that feels like being disconnected today. Uh, then, then you go on to, to, to 3G and, and we got 
the first smartphones and then we really, really saw the potential and, and we had the start of this development. And then 4G systems, the LTE systems were really designed to very efficiently support all the traffic out of the smartphones. And these, these systems are now being sort of the backbone of the mobile broadband systems all over the globe, right? So now we have 5G, and 5G is being standardized now. So the first release will be available now this summer. We will see, we will see products coming. Uh, we have systems in, in, uh, in operation now during the second half of this year, and during the beginning of next year, you, you will have the first smartphones on the market able to communicate on the 5G technology. And of course, this, um, th this will be so much more than, than just sort of the smart mo smartphone capability. So, so let's look in a little bit into what different things 5G will enable if you look a little bit outside sort of the mobile broadband use case. So it's all about use case driven and Already from the start, we, we set up 5G in order to be much, much broader in, in, in addressing a much, much more broader set of use cases. So it's about the broadband, mobile broadband experience. So it's everywhere and, and for everybody and every time. And, and, and this will, will see a lot of uh, evolvements here. Then moving into other sectors, it will be a lot of collecting data, a lot of, of, a lot of sensors that will be able to collect, uh, connect and, and collect all the data out of these sensors. And the fields here are, are, are very sort of different. And I, I think the technologies are now available here on the market and we see it in, in China. Last time I visited Beijing, there were sort of millions of bicycles on the streets. It was a little bit of an over-establishment, I think. But still, there were connected bicycles that you could rent by an app and, and use and, and return and so on. And, and all of this, this sort of the use of, of, of sort of a bike on, on, on a need basis were, were enabled by all the bikes were connected and then you were able to, to pick up a bike and pay for it and everything. Uh, so that's just one example. It will be many different examples coming there. Then going into the industries, uh, I think when we start to look at different industries, there are sort of pure efficiency gains of whatever you look at, just by connecting sort of the containers and you are able to follow sort of the, the, the logistics. I think on one of these ships is sort of 18,000 containers and the number of lost containers are, are sort of huge, right? So, so just keeping track of all the containers and make sure that they have not been sort of had any hazards during the, the transport or anything is a lot of value. And, and we are sort of going industry by industry in this. And then finally, there's a lot of use cases which are around sort of the smart cities, our ways of living in cities, the sustainability of cities, and just to be able to monitor and, and follow uh, all the different infrastructure pieces in the city and all the sort of efficiency gains that you can see by, by doing that. And, and this is just sort of first order use cases. And then I'm sure that when we have this in place, there will be a lot of new innovations on top of that. And, there will be applications running on these systems that we are not sort of foreseen at all today. Looking a little bit deeper into the technology behind here. So the first things that really drives now the build out of the 5G systems. The first use case that we see on the market is this fixed wireless access. And now we have a a wireless communication system, which is sort of have a capacity which is sort of comparable what you would need over your sort of fixed or fiber connection, right? So it's a possibility to offer these to households. 
That's an interesting thing to start with because you are a little bit owning the boat's ends and you don't need to have a sort of a wide area coverage in order to get started. You can sort of start in, in one part of a city and you can offer that to specific houses. So that's, that's being started now and some US operators are, are driving that. The real big thing is of course the enhanced mobile broadband. Um, just the fact that we are using so much more data all the time the mobile operators are at their capacity limits of the system, so with the current sites that they have available, they are using sort of all their, their frequencies, they're using all the technologies available, and they're still sort of hitting those are the capacity limits of these systems. And then, of course, getting new spectrum to the operators, getting a new technology, further increasing sort of the spectrum efficiency. This is always sort of a thing that is a good business case sort of to to invest in new technology compared to further densify the network. So this is sort of the fundamental driving force for building out these systems. Uh, next we have these massive machine type communications and these are, these are already available and, and, and these technologies, I have them on the next slide, these are done in such a way so they are sort of fully sort of running within a 4G carrier today. And so there is a system within the system, and that system within the system will also work within the 5G system. So these things are already now available on the market. And, and here we are now seeing the ecosystem being developed. We have, there is a lot of chipsets now available, and we are seeing this coming into different devices. And we see that operators are starting to offer sort of wide area coverage for, for connecting a lot of things. Then finally, which is perhaps the, from a research point of view and the much more challenging parts is, is sort of this critical machine type communication. And here we are talking very much of providing real time uh, capabilities into this system. And then it really has to be real time all over. So we are talking about having sort of control loops running over these systems where we are having a few milliseconds or even down to one millisecond control loops. Uh, on, on top of these uh, systems. We are talking about connecting very critical applications, so the requirements on, on security and safety are, are very, very high, of course. So that will sort of come uh, as the last uh, use case here. If we see that we start with the mobile broadband, we have all the massive machine-type communication, these will gradually be more and more demanding applications, and then we will be able to address these critical applications as well. Another thing which is, which is important to understand is, of course, some of these are truly wide area use cases. Some are more confined within an indoor environment like this. You can have a much more advanced system, obviously. You can make a dedicated deployment. You can have an, a factory floor or something where you have sort of a dedicated system to provide these properties. So, anything that can be connected will be connected. It will be smart and interactive. So, looking at this massive IoT parts, a lot of different sectors here will, will be. We have done the trials on, on the wine yards, <coughs> sort of measuring the, everything around the wine production and then regulating sort of water supplies and, and exactly knowing what, how to maximize your, your um, production in, 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 a, in a winery. We, we are now into smart manufacturing and, and of course there is a lot of sort of connecting a lot of pieces and a full view of all your supply parts. It's a lot of management and looking at the water and the transport logistics and so on. So it's a lot of things that could be connected here. <coughs> so um, the technology here, they are called CAT M1. This is the, the more advanced version of this. We have the narrowband IoT, which is a little bit simpler, and then we have something which works on, on GSM um, uh, grids as well and based on, on, on top of a GSM system. The first two here really works on, on top of LTE. So 
So the trick here is really to lower complexity. <clears throat> and by lowering the complexity of this, we are able to get the cost down of the chipsets. Um, and then we are sort of trading sort of real-time properties with, with, with the coverage. So if you are in a challenging position, you are repeating the signals, and then you're reaching further out. And, and by that, sort of, you can increase the coverage of these systems. <clears throat> and we, we have now, the, there was one uh, company installing water meters in a city south of here, in Malmö. And they have not yet found a cellar in Malmö that was not connected. So it's really bringing a lot of extra coverage. And I think, as the mobile broadband users, we also are very sort of dependent on the coverage. But to really make a, a, an industry and, and, and have a system, you're even more sort of want to have this. Yes, I know I have full coverage of this system. So this extended <coughs> coverage is a very, very important part of this. Then we have sort of going down a little bit in, in data rates, and we have increased the sleep modes and everything. Everything to make it work on, on, on one battery. You don't need to charge it. It should be able to be out there for 10 years or something like that. So you see the low cost, extreme battery lifetime, and very, very strong coverage. And this, this will make it possible to connect all of these things. And <clears throat> the strong thing about this is also that from the network side, this is really just a software upgrade. So you don't need to go to each and every base station and upgrade the system. So it is really, when turning this on, you have sort of full coverage, and you have extreme capacity. <coughs> on the top one here, you can connect one million devices per base station. So the, the, the capacity, and that just on, on this 1.4 megahertz. So, I mean, the capacity is there. So this is enormous potential in order to connect everything. Then, <clears throat> sorry. Then looking forward now on the 5G technologies, these are really super advanced systems, right? And uh, just to show one aspect of this, the properties of these systems, I have here selected an example where we can look at the multiple transmission points with multiple beams and how this works. And, and this example is on, on 28 gigahertz, so it's very high frequency. And, and the performance curve here is, is a little bit hard to read, but the scale there is in gigabits. So it varies here from one to seven gigabit per second. And it's also then able to do this for a very high speed moving vehicle here. So this we did together with BMW and uh, SK Telecom in, in Korea. And let's look a little bit how it works. So you will see the race car on this race track here, and you will see <coughs> the data rate on top and, and the speed of the vehicle on the bottom there. So, so it uh, starts to move there, and then you can see how the beams are now tracking the car, and then you have a fairly stable beam there when it goes on, on the straight there. You get a little bit further away, and then you shift over to the next sort of exit point, and you very rapidly change the direction there when, when you pass the base station, and then you get into the straight again, and then you get to the next one, and so on. So there's a lot of, of beam tracking functionality uh, needed in order to do this. And in order to, to, to learn the specifics of a system, we, we, we really believe that you would need to use machine intelligence and other properties in, in order to, to configure systems like this. <clears throat> the next important property I would like to bring when it comes to the 5G properties is the, the capability of network slicing. And that is really to have multiple industries, multiple use cases on the same one and the same infrastructure. And then sharing that infrastructure and giving each of the industries and each of the use cases their needed properties. So it, it's, it's, really, it's really about very advanced quality of service 
type of, of scheme, right? And, and it's, we have done that before when it comes to the radio channels, but now we really need to provide a network slice through the complete system in order to, to provide and cater for all of these different examples. And, and here we have a cooperation we are running together with Swisscom, and uh, it's about the train in, in, in Switzerland then, and it's really the combination of having all the mobile broadband users sitting in the train, watching YouTube videos or whatever, and having really, really high data rates, but more of sort of entertainment type of traffic, and then combine that with the remote control of this train. And, and I guess that sort of the safety parts of, of the remote control is, of course, much, much more important. So that has to be guaranteed, that has to be given that properties at the same time that we would like to use the system to provide both sort of the remote control of the train, there's a lot of other data coming out of the train, and sort of the passengers' uh, use of mobile broadband. And so this, this leads then to that the systems need to really be built on, on, on these different technologies. <coughs> And in order to realize then these network slices through these networks, we really need a combination of these things. So I talked a lot about the radio part already, right? So, so here we, we, need, we need, of course, the connectivity to, to we, we need to have sort of this um, beamforming technology, we need to be able to use all the different spectrums that are available, and we need to, to, to provide a very robust uh, communication. Then, in order to, to have these different slices in the network, we really need to make the, the, all the different nodes in the network programmable. And, and so here we have sort of the software-defined networking, we have the SDN controllers and so on. And by sort of orchestration, orchestration of the different parts, you will then be able to, to have the right properties. It's not only that, you also need to have the compute capabilities at the right, right place. And, and here, of course, we are very, very much interested in, in distributed aspects of that. So we would like to have the compute closer to the application when we need it, and we want to like to have it more central when that will provide a more cost-efficient solution, right? And, and here, there's a lot of different uh, technologies needed in order to make, to make this uh, uh, available and, and I have more details on this. And then on top of that, we, we need sort of the machine intelligence parts in order to, to, to make the right conclusions. And we even need it in, in the sort of automation of the system itself. So we are, we are sitting a little bit on two, two shares here. We are trying to provide all of these capabilities to industries and society. But we are ourselves in the telecom industry, of course, also sort of transforming and using these technologies in the system itself. So let's look a little bit on the different parts here. So this is just one example of ongoing research, which we think is very exciting. And that's sort of really trying to, to also have the forward, the packet forwarding in, in the nodes being programmable. And here we are then, um, the, 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 there is a, a lot of activities in this field. And, and we have this programming language for packet forwarding called P4. And it's really about <coughs> having a more of a high level description of, of how to have software handling the packets, how you sort of look at the packet, how you put it in, in, in sort of in, input queues, and, and then decides how it should go through this switch and, and then out. And we are really seeing that we are able to get very good performance out of these things. So, so it's not that it's necessarily so that there is a huge penalty in performance by, by using these uh, technologies. And, and of course, this programmability of the network combined then with, with the, the SDN controllers, um, you could be able to adjust and set the, the properties of your networks depending on what network slice you are able to try to provide to, to the end users. The other thing here is the 
compute. And then, of course, we are very interested in the edge compute aspects. And uh, if you really want to have a very low latency, you need to have the compute capabilities closer to the applications. And of course, <coughs> have them, have, having them in one of these central big clouds, then you, then you have sort of propagation delays just due to the distance. But there's a lot of networks in between here, which is not sort of always performing. Uh, so so you, you really need to take the network situation, the network congestions into account. All of that pushes sort of things out further to the edge. So you have edge clouds. Then you can think of pushing this even further. You can think of pushing this into the telecom systems. You can think of pushing it all the way out to a factory or something. And then there are other requirements that are also coming to play that the factory owner would like to have its data, it, it would like to have sort of control of the systems, and, and, and that also makes the need of be able to, to have the full system and, and all the compute at the, the factory site, so to say. So there are sort of capacity needs, there are latency needs, and there are definitely sort of legal, corporate, administrative reasons for, for this move towards the edge. And then I think everybody have their own view of what is actually the edge. And, and that is, of course, different and depends on who you ask. And, and the data companies, the data center companies, they, they, they have sort of one edge data center in each country, perhaps. They can move to a little bit smaller cities, and then you're really, really on the edge in their perspective. Mobile operators, they have sort of a lot of point of presence, very close. I mean, they are all, are all over with, with their, their cell sites and, and their central offices. They can go a little bit further out, obviously. And then if you were to, to think about some IoT vendor, perhaps they have a gateway somewhere, which is, which is their edge. And, and if you talk to the device, vendors, they, they think they are sort of the edge, and, and of course, all of this is, is, is perfectly uh, right, right? But it depends a little bit on what you want to, to do. And I think there's a really, really interesting things that how far you can push things and how much you can centralize, it's very, very interconnected to with the connectivity that you have between these different things. So it's a really a play between sort of compute and connectivity that you need to optimize together. So if you want to do this edge compute and you want to really go far out sort of with your compute, how could that look like? So let's start to look a little bit on the hardware, hardware side here. I think then you don't have a data center, you don't have the data center environment, so you need sort of a low footprint, and you need a little bit of environmentally hardened stuff. You will also need dedicated uh, hardware. It's not perhaps nor just normal CPUs. It could be also graphical processors or, or other hardware accelerators and so on that you would need on this, on this edge. On top of that, you need sort of have this integrated in your sort of cloud environment, but it really has to be low, low, low overhead things. You can't sort of use the same software technologies that you would use in a big data center. It has to be more lightweight in order not to take up too much of the capacity, which, which will be scarce at this more edge uh, unit. And you need then to support the different hardware accelerators, and you need to orchestrate your compute and your, your networking together here. And then on top of that, you need to run the applications. And here, I guess, we need to offer a low and straightforward sort of complexity for, for third-party application providers. You need to be able to write your application and not bother about exactly where it runs and how it moves between these different uh, compute capabilities. So it's, it's really, really important to have something here that is, is sort of uh, makes it sort of possible to, to have an ecosystem for all the applications on top of that. 
and that is also automatically sort of orchestrated where, where you run your different applications. So this edge compute thing is, puts a lot of challenges, but it's also something that op, op, opens up a lot of opportunities, right? So looking a little bit what we can do on top of this. So we have this example. We, we, we built a small Lego robot, and then we took the control out of this robot and moved that to, to real-time analytics in the cloud. And then we have a communication link in between, and then we, st we, we played a little bit with the latency. So let's see what happens when the latency increases in these systems. So in, the, so in this particular example, it was 50 milliseconds. Of course, depending on what you're trying to do, it will be different requirements. So that was an example of, of really low latency. Another example, which is more on, on high computational needs and, and where the data that you sort of are gathering is sort of, it's, it gets really expensive to ship, to, to ship all of this data around in a network. And then you would like to to have your sort of support for your application a little bit closer, not be able to transfer all the data. And it's also so that you need, need real-time properties of this. And there's a lot of different things being sort of tried out now in, 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 in a lot of different startups, trying to use uh, different forms of mixed reality. And uh, we have tried this, of course, as well. So we had the first example there, we have been adding mixed reality for miners. So being in the mine, you get a lot of extra information about what's going on in the mine, and you can see things and, and know where you are and, and get a lot, lot of extra information moving around in the mine. Another example is this uh, mixed reality city planning. So you can actually walk in the part of the city, you can see the existing buildings, but you can also see the new buildings. So you can see how the new buildings would look like and you can move around the buildings and, you can, and so on. So you, so you can use a lot of, of things in order to visualize uh, how a new thing would look like. So you can try out a lot of things in, 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 in a virtual reality and you can mix these realities in different ways. And in order to do these things, you really need to have a very good digital model of your surroundings, right? So, so I, I think we, we talked about digital twins I think you, everything sort of in society, you need to have a digital representation of, of everything in order to be able to play with sort of the digital model, adding things on top of this model and visualize these things. And you need also very precise positioning of your device or in this environment in order to be able to, to do all of these, of the, these things, right? So this is a very uh, interesting set of use cases. And this is really reflecting a little bit on this, that if you are providing all of this, we have the connectivity, we have the compute, we have this app environment, and you have this possibility to try out things, partly in reality and part, partly in, in virtual reality. Sort of everything that could be tried will be tried. And 
there will be a lot of sort of things that were not that smart, but there will also be a lot of things that were really revolutionary and show a completely new combination of these things. And I, um, I have the sort of opportunity to visit a little bit of startups uh, and have a, sort of a, be part of this community a little bit. And, and you're really surprised about what kind of different ideas that are being tried. You think, okay, you have that and that, you should try this one, but they are all over here and, and trying something completely different, right? And, and so there's a lot of things happening here. And, and one example is one of my researchers were thinking about what if I should have a window in my kitchen. So his, this is his kitchen, and he was thinking, okay, would it be good to have a window here? How would that look like? Then you can have a window, and then you can see, okay, how does that would look like? Would, would I like to move the window a little bit? And then, do, do I like the view? And, and, and the here, here. And, and you can, of course, think about different views then. But, so you can sort of try things. If you want to throw a ball out of there, it's also possible. And this is just shows how you can play with, with the mix of, of different realities. And, and it's not a big effort. There's a lot of software available where, where you can try all of these different things. So with these, these kind of systems, I'm, I'm claiming that the possibility, the, the thresholds of trying something will be even, even, will be much, much lower, right? So uh, if we have all of this, we have, the, we have the connectivity, we have the compute capabilities, and then we connect everything in society, then of course we need to keep an eye on the security aspects of this. And this is of course one of the things that will make things go slower. So it's important to take these things into account from the beginning. It's not so that we can have something added on in the late stage. It's not so that we can have something just protecting the surface of the system. We really need to have things protecting the complete system here, right? So, the, 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 the sort of the threat landscape here is, of course, that we have a higher complexity in these systems. So, they will be much, much harder to verify that these are sort of secure. We will have this virtualization and sharing of different things. So we'll have a lot of different applications running on the same infrastructure. How can we make a secure, how, how can we sort of be certain that different applications are not sort of leaking into each other? So we have a sort of a, a secure slicing uh, of the network. Crypto is going to be used, and of course the cyber-physical systems, which is in the heart of this, where you connect a lot of, of things, and a lot of these things will be mission critical and, and so on. So this is, of course, the, the threat surface and, and the value of, of attacking these systems will, will, of course, increase. Then uh, there is a lot of security awareness coming up, and we, we have, this is really surfacing now, which is, I think is very good. And there's a need for, for keeping track of all these identities of, of the users, the things, and, and everything. And, and then, when we are doing this, is a, we have now focused on, on the connectivity side first. So through this process, when we are standardizing things, we are trying to really work hard in order to cover these different aspects. So the resilience part, this is really that it, we should resist malicious attacks towards the system. The communication security is then that we have sort of encryption uh, through, so we, we make sure that the data is, is not tampered with. The identity managements are, are uh, of course, uh, a key thing, and, and we have been building the SIMs pre pre previously, and now we have different, different other forms of electronic SIMs, soft SIMs, that sort of can be more easy to work with. In, 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 these, in these type of applications. The privacy to protecting your identity and making sure that you are talking to an authenticated base station and the opposite. We had some cases where people are putting up false base stations and tricking terminals to connect to them. These things need to be, be addressed. And then finally, how, you, how could you assure that this is really 
what what, what you need. Are we really fulfilling all the aspects of the security here? So, so that's the security assurance part as well. Then, assuming that we got that in place, uh, on top of that, uh, having all of this data, we have connected all of this, we have connected all the data, we have the compute capabilities, okay, what to do with it, right? And one thing we will do is, of course, to use the development in machine intelligence of this data. And then, from a sort of a real-time communication point of use cases, of course, the real-time aspects <coughs> is very interesting. How it's possible to make sort of intelligent decisions on live data, how to push that towards the edge, and, and to keep the low latency on, on, on the, the machine intelligence. I think we have huge challenges here. We are working with, with a set of universities on this, of course, and, and we are really interested in the development. Then we also have this distributed versus centralized, and of course, it's very nice to collect a lot of data, have a big data set, and do your learning on that data set. But that's not always possible. You need, really need to understand sort of the distributed character of the system. So, for example, if you have a smart grid system and you have a fault in one power station, you really need to be able to act centrally on that problem in order to shut down the systems in the right ways. So you need to have this central virtual, virtual distributed understanding and also in the central part, you might have real-time requirements. But of course, the more further out you are, the, the, the easier it is to, to get more, more and more sort of low latency applications. Then the reinforcement learning is interesting. And uh, it's of course impressing this AlphaGo that we all looked at, right? And, and how the, the system were sort of achieving a superhuman capabilities by learning. And, and the, the trick is really you have a system and this learning agent and there is a state and they try different actions and, and there is a reward, right? And on a gaming situation or something, you can try a lot of actions, right? So you can, you can really explore, given your state, what kind of actions I can take and which are good and bad and everything. And by that, you, you, you take a lot of learnings. If you have a mission critical system in operation, you cannot, you cannot always do that, right? So then we need to figure out how we can use the technologies of reinforcement learning, although that we are sort of operating a critical system. So one way is, of course, to create a digital model of it and then, then try to take actions on, on a simulated system for a while and see what happens. You can think of having a slice of the system, which is just a small part, which is sort of your, your trial or test network that uh, you can you can do experiments on and so on. So this is an, an interesting field to, to really work further on. And the same thing comes to this machine learning and reasoning, how, how you're learning from the statistical data on that way, while you are sort of more developing your reasoning uh, capabilities from a more of a logic thing. And I think we, we really see that we need to have this interaction. So the machine learning needs to to get advice from this reasoning, and the reasoning needs to use the machine learning in order to improve the reasoning. So, so this is an, a, a very complicated and but interesting sort of field as well. Our own systems are said to that, that we are really needed to, to use our, our this technology in order just to, to run the communication systems as such, because these are getting more and more complicated than the settings in order to have all of these network sizes being orchestrated in parallel is, of course, extremely difficult. And, <clears throat> and all of these sort of admission control problems that you have, given the certain set of traffic, could I admit this new slice or not? How much will that affect existing slices and so on? And in order to do that, you, you really need to use sort of machine intelligence in your management system of this. And <clears throat> we have been doing this, um, starting from manual and then we have recommended parameters, and then we have these automated functions, self-organizing networks, which was sort of the first steps in this journey. And now we are really developing more autonomous features that are sort of adapting and learning the situation. 
And then you can have sort of cell specific, user specific, slice specific learnings, and you can really optimize the performance of the system. So, ending up here a little bit with an example on uh, smart manufacturing. And this really point to this point that these capabilities will really be sort of global, right? And, and there will be others trying things. So whatever you do, you will be challenged. And if you're doing something which is not efficient, there will be alternative solutions that will be more efficient and will then take over and create new values and so on. So it's really, really important to be on top of this change if you want to continue your business. And one thing is then manufacturing. And here the manufacturing companies are really seeing this and they are talking about the industry 4.0. And so looking at this story here from manufacturing, starting in, in, in late 1800s with, with sort of the first mechanical stuff being, and then going to the first assembly lines, and then getting sort of the, the control theory and the computers into this, and now then industry 4.0. And here we are really looking at a full automation of the factory, be able to reconfigure the factory <coughs> being able to make much, much small series, being able to, to have the, the factory then much, much closer to the market. And of course, this is, this is an opportunity for, 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 for countries and industries that are perhaps competing on where to, to have the, the, the production. And Germany is one of the leading countries here, and they are really working hard on this to make sure that their manufacturing industries that they have today can, be able, can still be competitive and take the full advantage of these new technologies. So what, what could be offered here is, of course, it's a very complex situation with, with the factory. So you have a lot of incoming parts that are connected. You do a lot of these of things in, in the factory. For example, you have this inventory and you have the forklifts. Only on the forklifts, I heard that there is more than 100,000 persons injured by accidents with forklifts yearly. And 100 people sort of dies out of forklifts accidents. So, so perhaps you can just automate the, all, all of this storage and, and, and get sort of all the people out of that part of the factory. And then the stuff is, is moving around here in the factory. There are robots working on it, and, and in the end, you get your product, and, and then it's shipped. And, and of course, all, all during this process, both before and after, everything should be then connected. So we have done this together with Comau and in, in, in factory in Italy. So we have started here with 4G, so now we have this work cell connected and we can sort of control the different tasks that these robots do. The control is still in the robots, the, the sort of the fine control exactly how to move the arm is, is still in the robot. If you were to introduce 5G on this, which we will do now during the, the second half of this year, we will be able to take all of this control out of the, out of the robot. So everything could be done then in a local edge compute capability in this factory. And then you can, of course, think about having multiple robots working together. And there's a lot more that could be interactive in this factory if all the control and all the data and all the knowledge of this factory floor is in this central cloud or in this factory cloud. So this is, a, this is very exciting for this uh, manufacturing parts. And here, I think we are, from a research point of view, and being having your technology, you are really sort of pushing the technology. But here's the opposite. They are really, really asking for this. There is a pull from this, these industries, and they really sort of see 5G as the sort of building block, the basic fundament of their uh, change curve. And we have been trying these things, and they are providing excellent 
capabilities, performance, robustness, really sort of addressing the needs of these factories. There will be so different many modes and capabilities so we can address all the different requirements when it comes to communication and connectivity in, in the factory. And it's a global standard, so it's possible to have an ecosystem around this and get really attractive costs and, and uh, equipment and uh, things available for for transforming the factories in this. So also in this use case, which is perhaps a little bit of, of the future-looking use cases I talked about today, there is a lot of things happening already today. And there's a lot of different factories. There are, of course, large factories with more advanced. There are smaller factories. There are new factories built and so on. So I think we will see a lot of things here coming quite soon. So let's, um, let's conclude. So to summarize, I've talked about sort of the connectivity, the edge compute, and sort of the machine intelligence on top of that. And from, from this, I, I hope that you really see that this is sort of enormous potential when you combine this. I think if you take another look and start with artificial intelligence development and see all the extreme power of that, and make the artificial intelligence real-time and capable of sort of addressing uh, each and every object around us, you can, you can another way of think about it, and, and that will also sort of point to the same enormous change that we have in front of us. And this is not far away. I think the technologies are ready. We, we are, and they are sort of already on the market, being sort of introduced on the market the coming years. So it's an exciting future in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. And uh, you will see there are two microphones here, and there are up. So if you have questions, so please come and uh, ask. And while uh, you are preparing to go, I uh, can... We have one first oh, one over it's there. there. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, hello, this is uh, Danny Dick from Oregon State. Thank you for a very nice talk. I really like how you were thinking about uh, different verticals of society that will be uh, enabled by IoT and 5G. I'm, uh, so I have two questions. One is, for you personally, what's the vertical that you are the most excited about that IoT and 5G will, will transform the society and our personal lives? For what's, what's the personal killer application that you personally are the most excited about? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good, good question. Um, I think different forms of augmented reality different ways of interacting with, with the smartphones and, and the sur surroundings. Um, I would really, really see how, how that could, could play out. And uh, <coughs> yeah, so, so that, that would be my personal pick. Um, from uh, more of efficiency and sustainability of cities and everything, I think there's so much things we can do in order just to sort of monitor the environment and, and the efficiency gains. I think using these technologies, I think we see that we can reduce, just, just on these efficiency gains, we can reduce CO2 emission by 15% or something. So that's, of course, a much even more higher value, of course. Yeah, so better utilization of resources and, and monitoring our environment. Yeah. So the second question that I have, this is the software engineering community, and what, what call for action do you have for us as software engineering researchers? How can we help Ericsson and other companies in this area succeed? What, what are the sort of key challenges? That, so you, you mentioned privacy and security, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have like specific call for action for us. How can we serve you? How can we help you? Yeah. Um. I think um, there is software in, in all of this, of course. Um, I'm, I'm very eager to see that we can have real-time properties. I think we are seeing things now that are sort of, there is software, yes, and then you are having a lot of applications and you're using all of this, but they do not really, they are not really real-time, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think to really provide an end-to-end -end real time experience and, 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 and characteristics of the systems that would need a different software architecture altogether. So I, there, that would be my sort of major challenge to all of you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Paolo Enverardi, University of L'Aquila. Actually, my question is very close to the previous one. And uh, uh, you, you know, of course, that the challenge now is to build these verticals. And uh, actually, Europe is investing uh, a lot in the next calls in verticals. So, uh, so I think that, and, and I would like to ask your opinion about, is that, okay, the technology is there. Um, the vision of a possible market in terms of verticals is there, but still there is a gap that is not obvious how to cover. Um, because I think that spreading this technology means also that the verticals should be provided in a more um, spread, spread way. Uh, I mean, there will be much more, there should be much more producers or verticals, or, no? Um, given, given the nature of a technology. How, how do you think this can happen? Because we also need different business models. Do you have any idea, you as a provider of a technology? Yeah, I, I think you are pointing to something which, which is really now the key questions. How we could sort of get this going vertical by vertical, how we can get the the ecosystems and, and the business models in place. Um, a few of these ex examples are more local. So then you could think of, of having a local provider of connectivity and, and, and compute and so on. But a lot of these things are more wide area. And then of course there is a need of wide area coverage. And, and then you also need a player of providing that wide area coverage and also the compute in that environment. So uh, I agree with your, your, your questions and I think this is also one of our key questions for, for companies like Ericsson, how we could monetize and make money out of this technology since the value of it is obviously so large and it's, it's a sort of unlock a lot of potential but you really need to get, get started there in a good way. And I think we will see starts vertical by vertical, but in the end, I, I really hope that we can be able to provide more horizontal platforms in order to make sort of this scaling in a much better way. Okay. So, so sorry for not having the precise no, answer. No, I, I know, one. but this is the question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for your uh, inspiring and fascinating talk about the communications in 5G. My question is a little bit futuristic. Uh, how do you see the communication industry evolve in next five years, like 6G? What would be the major driving force and also the key applications that you would like to solve? Thank you. Yeah, so um, next five years, I think we, since we, that's fairly sort of straightforward actually. It's, it is really now these technologies that are just coming out of the standards, these will be then deployed and be available. And that build out of the, of the new technologies will, will take these five years. So we will be busy by building out this during the five years. And then we, we of course will, will have first a little bit simpler application coming in and then we will gradually be able to to move to more and more critical applications. Uh, the mobile broadband usage of all of us will double every 18 months, the traffic or something like that. So, so, so it's fairly sort of straightforward in, in that. But beyond that, of course, it's much, much more open. In I think we have really tried now to build these systems in a, what we call a future compatibility way. We, we have really tried to, in the standardization, prepare for that we will have new applications, new requirement coming. So there is a lot of all the, the specifications for a particular users are really confined. You really have the user data and the control data in a particular beam to that particular user. So there is a lot of space to, to add. So, so a lot of new ideas that will come up could be added to 5G and, and 5G will evolve for, for five, 10 years. Then, if that will continue to evolve, or if it turn into some 6G, 6G or not, I, I don't really know. But uh, we have really tried to make it forward compatible in, in the way to, to take in all of the new good ideas. 
Thank you. So you talked a little bit about software-defined networking, where you have languages that begin to define um, sort of strategies for routing packets and other things. Well, it seems like you also talked a lot about edge computing. And I'm wondering if there's going to be some kind of convergence there, where you're going to start to see uh, sort of uh, programming languages that both manage network resources and also perform some kind of aggregation or map reduce or that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, do you see kind of an evolution where the network and the cloud come together in some sense? Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I think you are spot on. Um, at first, we would like to see that we can sort of do uh, a joint optimization of these two resources. Then moving forward, I think the networking and the compute will be very much uh, intertwined. So yes, I, I, I do very much foresee that exactly what you, are, what you are posing there. Thank you. Yes, please. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my name is Sagar. I'm from Norway. Uh, I work as a researcher, but also founded a startup three years back. It's actually an IoT startup. So we make sensors for sports, uh, rowing especially. This is uh, my sport, and we make sensors for it. So uh, I totally relate to the problems that you talk about. So for instance, we have sensors that we use in the middle of the sea and connect to, I mean, we use Bluetooth 4, and now we're looking into Bluetooth 5. And we also connect to the cloud in the middle of the sea when someone's rowing. So one of the problems that we have as developers is that we have so many different protocols and um, uh, communication protocols that are coming up, such as 5G, narrowband IoT, Bluetooth 5. Um, and of course, the software support for these new protocols is not very mature. So we always face the problem of uh, choosing the right protocol. Uh, of course, energy consumption is something you didn't mention, uh, but you were focusing more on applications where energy consumption is not an issue. But we have that because we are in the middle of the sea and we can't plug the sensor into a power source. So my question is, now, with all these different standards like Bluetooth 5, NB IoT, 5G, and so on, uh, how do, you, how do you predict uh, what will survive and uh, uh, what is best for us to invest time into um, and how to go about it uh, collaborating with, um, for instance, communication service providers like yourself or Telia or Telenor, for example? Yeah. I think... Um on, on the communication technologies, which are a little bit more wide area, um, the footprint of, of 4G LTE is, of course, the, the, the biggest today. And, and as these new technologies of narrowband IoT and so on, our software upgrade on these systems, these will be extremely powerful, and it will be very good and easy to build these out systems out. They are basically there already. So I think that will be a very safe bet. And there, I did a little bit address the energy efficiency on the battery lifetime of these systems. And, and, and these can really, really be very efficient on, on, on the battery lifetime. Then, then I think we, we have been thinking a lot about the migration from these 4G technologies to the 5G technologies. And um, I think we in, in the industry have been fairly good of, of being, having the old systems uh, moving forward and being part of the new sort of systems, and I guess you can still. It doesn't. It's not so huge, uh, common today, but of course you can still use GSM. If you take, would take up your old phone here and, and try to make a GSM call, you most likely would be successful in that, right? So, I think the lifetime of the systems w will be there. So. Um, I'm a bit biased here, of course. Uh, we, we are working heavy on the sort of 3GPP global standards. But I think that that's, that's where you should go. There will be an ecosystem. And, 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 the, and the key thing is the scale of the chipsets in order to get these, the prices down on these for the devices. And I think you will see that there. Just an add-on question. So if, if you compare NB IoT and Bluetooth 5, what would you choose? 
you. Yeah, it depends on what I want to do. If I want a little bit of wide, <coughs> wide area coverage, it's no question you need to have the, the narrowband IoT. If you are in, within a home or something and you have a lot of small things, uh, Bluetooth is interesting. And now with these mesh capabilities on top of that, it provides a little bit of multi-hop in, in a simple setting. I think that's interesting, and we have been active on, on these standards as well. So, uh, depends on, yeah. on what you want to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask a concluding question. So, uh, Ericsson has a lot of cooperation with academia, and you have mentioned several times this cooperation. So, I would like to ask you how do you see the, this cooperation, or what are the like uh, the best cases for you, and what what is the most challenging in this uh, this cooperation, and what would be your uh, questions from academia? What would you like to have to get? Yeah, this is. I think we are both industries and, and research in industries, and also you, academia. We are all challenged by the speed of this change. I think we. Uh, we all need to have the capabilities of working on, on data from networks and systems in operation. So I think we should try to join forces around uh, doing research on top of sort of live data. And, and, and we need to get into situations where we can get data of a system, we can do some reinforcement learning and try actions and learn of that. Because the ones that can do that would learn so much more, so much faster. So if we industry and you academia would like to be relevant going forward, I think we need to adapt to this pace of, of change and we need to, to think about ways of working together. And we can be part of that by sitting on some of this data, but there's a lot of other applications and, and, pro, and industry out there that you need to work with. And together we, we, we need to be more data driven in also in our work, I think. And that's a big challenge. Uh, and I, I think we're into this together. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very so much. Thanks, Magnus. <laughs> and uh, uh, here is some small chocolate from Gothenburg. You are from mm. Stockholm, but this is from <laughs> Gothenburg. So and, I will uh, enjoy. Yes, and this is the book uh, from uh, about ICSI, 40 edition. So thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, and now we have a break until uh, 11 o'clock, and then you can go to the ninth parallel session. So, thank you. <laughs>